Hi, my name is Cameron Miller, and this is Trinity Place in Geneva, New York, and this is a reflection on the readings from the lectionary for the ninth week of Pentecost, uh, which is largely from Second Kings, a story from Second Kings, and a couple of stories from John's Gospel in chapter 6. So it is, in case you didn't know, the 21st century, and we have discovered planet 452b, that may be an earth double and we have just recently uh, discerned what the core of the planet mars looks like how can we not see stories about elisha and jesus differently than people before us did and how can we not ask different questions of these stories even from when we first heard them but here's an open secret these stories were not intended for us. We are strangers to those ancient storytellers. We live in a, another continent 2,000 or more years away. So let's recognize that these stories were not even meant for us. Second King Kings reports four miracles performed by Elisha. And in order to they and he tell them in order to demonstrate that he is an appropriate successor to the prophet Elijah. Then, a thousand or more years later, John attributes the same miracles to Jesus in order to demonstrate that Jesus is an appropriate successor to the prophets Moses, Elijah, and Elisha. In all of John's miracle stories. Jesus one-ups his, his, pre his predecessors. And that's the point of his stories. Uh, we just hear, we hear in the miracles and in our 21st century seat, we ask if such things could really, really happen. Or we reject the veracity of such stories. But for the author of John's Gospel, the point of the stories is not for us, Rather, it's for Jesus' wow factor being bigger and better than Elijah or Elijah's, Elisha's wow factor. Everywhere in 2 Kings, Elijah and Elisha, I'm sorry, elsewhere in 2 Kings, Elijah and Elisha are walking along, and they're followed by a bevy of lesser prophets, disciples, so to speak, when they come to the river. And then, without skipping a beat, Elijah smacks the water with his robe, and the two of them walk through the water on dry land, echoing back to Moses at the Red Sea, parting the waters and walking through. Now, in John's story, Jesus doesn't need no stinking magic robe for him to walk on the water, not through it. Likewise, Elisha does three food tricks during a time of terrible famine. And the final one is the one that we heard this week in, in Pentecost, that he feeds a hundred men with only a single tithe of food, which means uh, that somebody gave him, which means that he had just enough food to feed one prophet or one person. And yet after feeding a hundred, he still had food left over. Well... We know that Jesus has just enough food to feed one family in John's story, but after he feeds 5,000, there's plenty left over. Now, in a more innocent time, such a competition of miracle stories was used by preachers and evangelists and ordinary folks sharing their faith to prove that Jesus was God. I can remember thinking the same thing as a kid. In my Sunday school mind, I thought, wow, walking on water, that proves it. But I don't remember any sermons from my childhood in which it was pointed out that the other great prophets of Israel did similar such miraculous things. And when I was a kid, no one ever told me about Melarepa, the great Tibetan spiritual master who could fly. We had Jesus who did such big stuff, but any other stories that we heard were dismissed as myth mythological or cartoons. At least that was my childhood. I don't know about yours. 
But that was then, and this is now. There are still churches that speak of the Bible as proof of itself. Churches that try to kind of hermetically seal its members within a cocoon of thinking, so they are not troubled by obvious questions raised by using the Bible as proof for itself. But in our tradition, the authority of the Bible is not that it is unassailable or that it's an eyewitness account or that there, that it's based on the belief that the Bible is meticulously detailed, factual version of events recorded verbatim with the miraculous assistance of God. It's none of those things, at least not in our tradition. The authority of the Bible is that we are the same community in another time, in another place, seeking, struggling with, and encountering the presence of God in our midst. We're the same community as that community in the Bible, and we're doing the same things, and we're seeking the same things, and we're struggling with the same things as those people did thousands of years ago, only we're different because of culture and history and science and technology and on and on. The problem with the Bible is not the Bible itself. The problem is what we have laid on top of it, layer after layer. As the early religious movement survived Jesus, it aged and it developed and it spread, and then it became the religion of an empire. When that happened, Christianity sought to kind of harmonize the Bible. It felt the need to harmonize all the conflicting stories because they wanted it to reinforce the countless beliefs it brought to the Bible from far outside the Bible. In other words, for example, 500 years after Jesus, Christians living in what's now Turkey and who were citizens of Rome wanted the scripture to make it conform to their worldview and their religious assumption. They didn't want the Gospels, for example, to contradict each other or to be in tension with what they believed. Uh, or to be, yeah, in order to be intentional with what they believed. Um, so they imposed upon the Bible and the biblical stories an interpretive matrix that mushed things together, ignored internal contradictions, and made things fit into a nice harmonious whole. But they weren't alone. Christians in Ethiopia did that. Christians in Egypt did that. Christians in Spain did that. Christians in Britain did that. Christians on the Minnesota Prairie did that. We have wrung the Bible through paintings and stained glass images and maudlin, triumphant, and sentimental hymns and spirituals and every other kind of art and cultural prism at our disposal until the people and the events and the ideas of the Bible look and sound like us, like we want them to. We did all that to harmonize the wildly divergent uh, and utterly disorganized and truly eclectic stories of the Bible, as if they formed a clear image and delivered proof for our way of thinking. Here's a kind of interesting way I, I like to think about it. Let's say that everybody who is part of this congregation, whether in person or virtual, has been keeping a spiritual journal that describes our understanding of what God's doing in our lives, or in some cases complaining about what God is not doing in our lives. And let's say that the people of Trinity Place have been keeping their journals since, oh, let's say, 1806 when it was founded. And, and now let's pretend that somehow all those scraps of paper were brought together and typed into a computer. What we would have would be a wild mishmash of perspectives flowing across a period of time that witnessed the Second Industrial Revolution, two world wars, a Cold War, 
the discovery of electricity and flight and the splitting of atoms, not to mention the rise and fall of antibiotics, terrorism, and many, many more wars. The quality of the writing in such an imaginary text and the breadth and the narrowness of perspective and the peculiarity and ordinariness of the content would be wildly different from one person to another and from one generation to another, even within the same households. So just imagine the difference, for example, between Bunny Bell, Kathy Flick, Beth Henderson, Howard Sabin, Cam Miller, Sherry Gibbon, and Kim Donsalier. Imagine the differences in what we would have written in our daily journals. So what kind of violence would we have to do to all of that writing that all those people from 1806 to today and all those generations produced in order to make it a, a harmonious, have a harmonious point of view? So one of the truly wonderful and amazing things that's happening in the world these days is the effort to return the Bible to the Bible with all, all that harmonizing going on. Even so, we will never be able to kind of strip away everything that we have laid over the Bible in the, in the biblical text. And there is no pure and pristine original to get back to and uncover anyway. For one thing, the Bible was originally told, not written. It was spoken, or much of it was spoken, not written. And when it did get written down, it was done in disconnected scraps by a variety of editors over a great many years in cultures and languages. So there is no original Bible for us to uncover and say, Aha, here it is, like some buried pirate treasure. It came to us in pieces over time and from different voices in different cultures in different languages. But what is exciting is that we can begin to see what we have laid on top of the Bible and to recognize it as our effort to harmonize what was not originally in harmony. We can learn a lot about ourselves by seeing what we have shellacked the Bible with. And we can learn more and more as we keep digging. So one thing that means is that you will not, never hear me say, well, Jesus walked on water, therefore Jesus is the Lord of nature, which is what John or Mark would have wanted us to say. What I might say instead is that this story originates in the Gospel of Mark, who uses it to proclaim Jesus as the Lord of nature, and that John retells this story a generation and a half later to proclaim that Jesus is even greater than Elijah and Elisha. So you see, it even changed purpose and meaning as told from Mark to John. So I don't proclaim that something in the Bible really, really happened. Instead, I try to point out what the particular editor or author hoped we would see. And like Paul or Augustine or Dorothy Day, I will converse and argue with the story rather than simply believe what Mark or John or the Second Council of Nicaea may have wanted us to believe. But that still leaves the question of whether or not Elijah could part the waters of the Jordan or Elisha could feed a hundred men with a portion of a lot, a, a portion allotted for one man, or whether Jesus could walk on water and feed five thousand with an amount normally shared by a single family, or, for that matter, whether or not Melarepa could fly. We all come to such questions from different places, different points of view. I'm more inclined to focus on small details like this one from John's story, where it says, Jesus knew that the people planned to come and take him by force and make him their king, and so he left and went up to the hills alone. <laughs> I mean, listen to that. There's so much more for us 
in that one measly sentence than wondering about miracles. Jesus, taken by force, the crowd wanting him to make him their king, Jesus stomping off to be alone in the hills. I like to think of the Bible as a holy parasite. Yeah, a holy parasite that worms its way through our thoughts and into our hearts and into our minds, causing us to see the world differently and to do things that might actually risk our own self-interest. A sentence like that one is a parasite, and it will worm its way inside if we drop our guard. All that miracles require is a yes or a no. It's all the other stuff that's far more dangerous. Peace be with you.